This morning, I want to talk about a passage that I've preached on many times in different ways. But I want to focus on the moment of this situation. I preach the same passage. Look at me actually remembering something. Usually I forget. I preach the same passage January 2019. No, no. It was the first or second message in the movie theater, which happened January 2020, pre-shutdown. That's what it was. They all just run together. Don't you know pastor weeks are like dog years? (laughs) You miss one, it feels like you missed an eternity. So I love it. And let's give it up for Nick last week. Thank you, Nick, for sharing what's on your heart. And as he said, he's my nephew, so we have a special relationship. Sometimes crosses the pastor line, and I have to remember we're at church. (laughs) But I want to give you Exodus chapter 14, 10 through 28. I just made a mess of my Bible. Now it looks like I use it more. I just crinkled the page trying to fix the... Is anybody really OCD with their walk with God and as soon as God causes a crinkle, you don't know what to do about it? Because you're so uptight for your walk that God can't do anything. God can't put any scribble marks on your sermon notes because it's not perfect. That's not faith. You got to deal with the crinkles. My Lord, look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Look, you can't tell, but it looks like I pulled the paper out of the trash because I was trying to fix the, the bind and I crushed it with my Holy Ghost power. (laughs) You got to deal with crinkles. You got to deal with chicken scratch on God's plan because if you can't adjust, you'll cave to pressure in the heat of the moment. And that's what we're looking at. We're looking at this moment that we've all heard. How many have heard the story of God parting the waters of the Red Sea to let Israel flee from the Egyptian hand? Has anybody heard that story before? Look at you scholars. (laughs) So we all know the story, but today we're going to focus on the moment and what that felt like in the transition of when God told them to go immediately. Exodus chapter 14, verses 10 through 28. This is right when Israel is being called by Moses through the Red Sea so that they can escape, escape the hand of Egypt about to take them over because they're fleeing Egypt. So Egypt's like, we don't want you to leave. We want you to stay so you can be our slaves forever. And God said, no, you got to go to the promised land. But if you want to go, you got to go now. So they didn't really have time to have a meeting about it. There's moments where you've just got to know when to go. You just got to do it. There's moments when you just got to pull the trigger, so to speak. You can't keep planning. Some things you can't plan for. You just got to deal in the moment because there's no time to waste. And that's where we are with Israel. Verse 10, chapter 14 of Exodus says, as Pharaoh approached the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified. Look to your neighbor, tell them terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, who was leading them, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die, Mo? What were you thinking, Mo, Mo? Moses, what have you done to bring us to us by bringing us out of Egypt? You know, you know, isn't it funny that when there's a change up and God does something different, you actually can actually run back to the devil, you know, because it's familiar. And that's essentially what they were saying. It's more convenient to go back to what we know, even though it was the enemy, because it's comfortable, because I'm used to it by now. Then Moses said, was it, be- excuse me, verse 12, didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. And Moses answered the people, verse 13, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. 
The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. God doesn't say you're never going to have no problems anymore, but he said this problem today, it's not coming back because I'm going to wipe it away forever, but you got to listen to my voice and stand firm. Everybody just stomp your foot nice and easy. Don't hurt your knee on the floor. Stand firm. Don't run. Don't run back to Egypt. Stand. The Lord will fight for you. You just need to only be still. He shushed them. You ever shush your kids? You know, they're like, but yeah, but shush, shush, shush. after a while, when you deal with my children, I told Michelle, there's nothing left but to just keep going. Shush, shush, shush. Violence doesn't work. Not that we would try that. Um, verbal abuse doesn't work. Not that we would try that. Threatening, nothing worse. Shh, shh, shh. And eventually they, still. Because when they just calm down and be still, their father can get through to them. So Moses said, shh, shh. They're like, give, give we, we, golden calves. Do what we got to do. We'll serve somebody else. We'll go back to Egypt. We'll die. Shh, 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 shh. Be still, he said. The Lord will fight for you. Be still. Sound familiar? See, the Israelites were just as hard-headed as us. They just, you know, didn't have the cool smartphones back then. But they did have internet, as we know, because it's biblical. So the Lord will fight for you. Then the Lord said to Moses in 15, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move it on, on, move it on, move it on. Raise your staff. I like how God told him to participate in this process. God said, for you, Moses, to participate in this process, that if you want me to deliver your people, you got to be part of the process. That sounds like something, that sounds like the church, doesn't it? You got to be part of the process if you want to see something move, because God can't do it without you and me and people. So he says, Move on, raise your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on the dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. <laughs> I wonder if God laughed like that afterwards. <laughs> I don't know. It sounds more like Inspector Gadget, the bad guy. I will harden their hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them and I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all of his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. That doesn't make any sense. We'll get there. Verse 18, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. You see how he repeated that? Then the angel of the Lord who had been traveling in front of Israel's army withdrew and went behind them and the pillar of cloud. You've heard of the cloud that was leading them. Well, now the pillar of the cloud joined the angel and went behind the Israelites from in front and stood behind them coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel, a divide. God went between them. You notice that? A divide between Throughout the night, the cloud brought, so they stayed there in this moment, but the cloud brought darkness to the one side and to light to the other side. So neither went near the other all night long. So they were like right next to each other, but they couldn't see each other. So they didn't know they were right next to each other. Isn't that funny how God does that? He'll put you right next to something you didn't know was there. He'll put you right through a breakthrough you didn't know was there. So they stayed there all night like that. And then in 21, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And all that night, the Lord drove the sea back with the strongest winds and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided. And the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on the right side and the left. I don't know if you can imagine, this is what I had preached on before, was the walls that this created. And you're in between it. We want to talk about pressure. The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord locked down from the pillar, looked down, excuse me, from the pillar of the fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. Confu I cannot speak today. Confusion. He jammed the wheels. He gave him a flat tire. Okay. 
He gave the Egyptians a flat tire of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let us get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Israel. You know, the enemy is smart enough to know who God is, though he don't serve God. Just like, just like the, um, the demons in Legion, they knew who Christ was, but they didn't serve him. And you can know of God's greatness, but doesn't mean you're serving God just because you know. And so the enemy actually recognized God's greatness first before Israel did. And they said, let us get out of here. Then the Lord said to Moses, man, I am a mess today. It's the lake, it's the lake brain. I don't know. Stretch out your hand over the sea. Yes, I said that already. So he parted. Martin stretched out his hand, verse 27. And the day broke. As the day broke, then the sea went back into its place, started coming back together. And the, it, this is after the flat tire, so they're stuck. Israel's moving on. Then the Egyptians were fleeing toward it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water, last verse, flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea, not one of them survived. So let me play it back real quick. God, what do we do? I'm going to part the waters and use Moses to do it. And it's going to separate so you can escape Egypt. That's crazy, God. Let us go back to Egypt. No, I think you should listen to me. So Moses shushed him, got him to listen for a second. They thought, yeah, Israel, uh, Egypt was not that fun. So they went ahead and went through. And then as they're both going through, they had to create some distance between each other. And they had to sleep also. So right before they entered the sea, God put the cloud and the angel between them so they wouldn't know they were actually resting next to each other. So then God could make an escape for Israel as Moses parted the water. But then he jammed up the wheels of the Egyptians, he threw a stick in those things. I think it's like a, like a buggy wheel, like a little house on the prairie is what I see. He threw a stick in them and they got jammed up. And as Israel evades the waters, guess what Moses does? He commands the water back. God uses him to bring the waters back together. And remember, he said, you will never see them again. They didn't see him again. They did. They drowned. Can we say dead in here? They drowned in the water mysteriously. They're like the Bermuda Triangle. We don't really know if they're gone, but we can't find them. They're dead. (laughs) So this message is about this moment when God told them to go through the water. And they had to decide. Nobody made them take their little legs and run through the water. They had to decide, are we going to do it? And so oftentimes we confuse go with no, and we don't know which one God is saying. And as often as we feel like we're waiting on God because he is indeed patient, let me tell you, we, we wonder how we might handle it when actually God is ready for us to move in the blink of a moment. Be careful because God might ask you to do something in the blink of the moment when you've been waiting for an eternity, it feels like. Now God's saying something different. The last thing we want to do is not be ready when God says it's time. That's the last thing. Don't sleep in the garden because that moment you fall asleep is when the Romans come. Don't sleep on God because he never stops working because he's working in the moment you think is most insignificant. It's often the greatest moment. Don't stay in the camp. Get some rest. Get through the waters, he said. We want to be ready. And to be ready, we must stay in contact and observe God in every part of our lives. We must live a life of generosity. Is he talking about giving? Amen. Yes, we give of everything in our life because generosity is what opens the door for God to shape clay. It's who we are. It's what we do. We are God's people, and we are a generous church. We are a generous people of God that God wants to use. That is how we stay in contact with the plan. Keeps us conscious, keeps our focus on Christ, allowing him into all decisions. That's hard to do. It's easy to have him in some, but all ew. That's faith. The best blessings sometimes come at unexpected times. Even when we've prayed for them so long, we got to make sure we're actually ready. (laughs) Story of my life. When they arrive, 
hey, you're having a baby. I was ready. What? What do I do? You know, like, like the devil will mess with you. I can handle it, and I'm not scared, but I had to kind of smack myself a couple times. And remember, God is in this. You've waited patiently so long now. So what will you do when God says go? My subject today is when God says go. What will you do? And like I said, it's easy to confuse when God says go with when God says no. That's the hard part. Has anybody else fought this battle? Did he say go or did he say no? Has anybody else f- felt that? that it's, that's the hardest part. Is it of God or is it not? Did God call me to it or did God say stay away from it? Is it crazy or is it, is it faith? Is it, is, it, is it fear winning or is it faith winning? Am I, am I losing it or am I faithful man of God? Like where is the line? Anybody felt this? Come on, somebody. Is it go or no? In this situation, it was indeed go. When God says go. When God says go. That urgency, that moment that they had no time. The chariots were coming towards them. You seen like Braveheart, some of these movies, you see them coming towards you. Do you really have time to have a Zoom call about it? No. There's a point where your faith has to act on instinct because urgency requires trust. Urgency requires a trust that you can't even think about it. Do I trust this? I don't know. There's no time to even process. I just have to go. I have to go. And what with this, we were talking about this the other day. We were talking about the egg hunt we did. Does anybody remember the egg hunt out in the backfield back in Easter? And uh, come on, somebody. I know y'all lying to me. Y'all remember the egg hunt. So we're in the middle of the field, and we think there was a 1,500, 2,000 people somewhere in there, kids, grandpas, uncles, aunts, dogs, whoever, surrounding the perimeter. And so, so we had the megaphone. We had the plan. But the people had their own mission, and we learned some things, that when God says go, there's no stopping the flow of what's happening. When God let those waters move and move back, there's no one going to get out there and say, hold up, waters, we're not quite ready. Starbucks isn't open yet. It's, It's on. It's on when God says go. It's on, and you better be ready to flow with God because if you don't, you're going to get left behind with the Egyptians. So we've got to train to trust in the urgency of the situation. That's difficult, and you can't plan for it, so you just have to be conditioned for it. You have to be conditioned for it through repetition, through instinct of trust with God in everything we do. All, everything we incorporate God into our lives is a way that God conditions us so then when there's a big thing, you don't even have to think about what will I do because God said go, I'm going. It's not easy. It's easier to say, why don't you take us back to Egypt and bury us there? We don't even care about having graves anymore because this is miserable. I don't like the pressure of this. It looks scary. That timidness, timidness is what the enemy wants you to do when God says go. When God says go, he wants you to say, no, I'll get back to you. Because as you think that's when the chariots are approaching. As you think, and God is moving out from the sea back to the land, you're still in the middle dealing with broken wheels of the enemy. You with me? There's no time for this. There's no time. The clock is ticking on the church world. There's no time. Well, someday God, no, God, do it now. Like I told Nate, I'm in my car. God, just do it. Like we argue. We argue. Say, God, I'm ready. I asked for this. Do it. I love you, God. Do it. Test me, God. Like that's that's how that's how like I'm not telling God what to do, but God wants that because He wants to know that when He says, Okay, you've waited, you've waited, you waited, go. Boom. You're the first one out the gate. You can praise for that because that's a test of your faith. It's easy to sit in a chair. It's hard to run when God says, go now. That's scary. I don't even know what's on the other side of that thing. How do I know that the dry land is better? Because God said, go. That's how I know. 
What's harder? I don't know about you, but what's harder? To trust in the moment of urgency or to patiently wait on the things of God? That's a really good buzzword in the church these days. I'm just waiting on God. I'm patiently waiting on God. What's harder? You know, you can wait so long that when he finally says, okay, do it, that you don't know how to react. You can be numb to it. When Michelle got pregnant, we wanted the baby for so long that when it finally happened, I'm like, really? This is it? Like, I was numb. We were numb. We almost doubted it. We questioned it because we had conditioned ourselves to just keep waiting and not really expecting deliverance. So it's, it's important. That's why we say we, do, we put God in everything we do because when we disconnect from that generous Christian life we are to proclaim the gospel with, we disconnect. And that's when we're caught off guard in the middle of the waters dealing with broken wheels. That's for the Egyptians, but you're Israel. And God said, you're to get out because I said, go. Does anybody like UFC? UFC, they do the crane kick in the UFC said no one ever. <laughs> Daniel, I'm sorry, but you'd get probably beat up in the UFC. Mr. LaRusso, I love you. Go back to waxing your cars. I'm sorry. Okay, so we, the UFC sponsors one seed church. No, I'm, I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> we like, my family likes wrestling. We like sports, and we tend to watch karate and violent stuff. And, you know, if it gets, if it gets too bad, we make the kids turn their eyes. Um, I don't know. But these fighters, when they're in the fight, they're not thinking. They're reacting. Because they were thinking and training for months for the fight. So when the, and you can do it in any sport. Baseball, don't have to be violence, even though, you know, I know it's weird, but, you know, we, we have an endorsement by the UFC to support violence in the church. Just kidding. It doesn't have to be Fighting, but fighting is just an example that came to me that by the time they get in there, they've trained their body, military, all these things are the same. They've trained and trained and trained because when the heat of the moment comes in the real situation, what do you do? You just react by instinct. Why? Because you have to. Because if you wait one split second, I'm sure all my military brothers and sisters can vouch for this. If you wait one second, that's when the enemy takes out your, your, your squad person. That's when the enemy strikes hardest is in the hesitation. So we have to be aware and ready, and it may take forever, but finally, when God says go, we're out. See you, wouldn't want to be you, don't even think about it, I'm gone for the gospel. It's not easy to do, but that's what they had to do. There was no choice. And that's what we had to do. And for all the people that say, I'm just not qualified. You remember Moses had a stutter and he couldn't speak it right. And he tried to opt out. He tried to give it to his brother. He tried to do everything he could to get away from the mission. And God says, I'm going to deliver it. But it's through you who need to stretch out your hand. Moses, stretch out your hand. Moses didn't have any power. It was just a stick. It's not witchcraft. He's not, a, he's not a sorcerer. He's not Simon the sorcerer. It was just a stick. But God knew that if he put his faith in what God said, that God would use him to flow the power of God through the Red Sea. So all that to tell you, it happens through you. It happens through me. It happens through people. It's through us that God does it. It's through us that God does it. Stretch out your hand, he said. God did it. But he said, through Moses, stretch out your hand. I'll do it through you, Moses. If we don't train ourselves up according to his word, we might react like the Israelites in question. And it's not the first time they did it. This was a regular thing. They'd never had much good to say to Moses. Poor Moses was just the most underappreciated leader and he had their best interest. You know, God can have your best interest when you think he's hurting you, when you think he's withholding from you. And God is saying, I'm trying to deliver you. I don't love it either, says the Lord. I hurt when you hurt. I have emotions, and you have emotions because I have emotions. So when I make you go through this, this is the only way out. You got to go. You got to go. It's through you. When I rely on God, but don't 
believe he'll use me. I will stumble and trip when the sea is closing. Quit, quit doubting. If he can use this, this, this guy here, he can use you. He can use you. He can use you. He can use anybody, and he does, and he will. It's a heart condition. God needs to perform a surgery of the heart for you to be changed and be used. To throw out doubt. We talked about, is it harder to trust in urgency or patiently wait? Is it harder to trust when you know the outcome or when you don't? I can tell you some of the best decisions personally, looking back in hindsight, you know they say hindsight's 2020. It's the decisions I was terrified of in, in the foresight because I didn't really know. Like I, I had a sense of like, I call it strategic risk. There was a sense of risk and I knew like, what's the worst could happen? Okay, it destroys my life. It ruins everything. Okay, but no, no, really. Like there's a little bit of, there's a little bit of margin of error in there because nothing will ever be safe completely. There's no risk-free, valuable decision. But there's a point where in hindsight, we look back and said, remember when we were scared to do that and we believed God and we took action? Or remember that? Remember when we thought God wouldn't give us a baby? Now we've got five of them? What? what? We didn't even plan for that. What do we do with these things? Like, like it, God will do that. And in hindsight, you'll think, man, what was I thinking? It was just so easy. It was easy because it was in hindsight. In the moment, it took faith. In the moment, it took faith to cross the waters. In hindsight, I'm sure they're, they're looking back, telling their, telling their friends on TGIF that remember that time we went through the Red Sea and uh, we were just kind of nervous and it was just such a piece of cake. After God said, go through the sea, we'll just make the horsemen stumble and we'll, we'll save y'all. Like, like it was so, they tell it like it was no big deal, but in the moment they were terrified, it said. But they had to go. They had to go. Does anybody remember the never-ending story? <laughs> Thank you, Tricia. Anybody? Betray you? Pam? That's because I had it on VHS tape back when VHS tapes, young people, were just a thing, a new thing. You take them home, you tape off the edges, you copy that bad boy, and you've got never-ending story for the rest of your life in SP. SP quality. That's before HD digital SP. P. Anyway, my mom just recently told me, yeah, I didn't know they had ratings back then on movies. I'm like, I could tell. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, Pam. I mean, mom. But uh, I had like the Lost Boys. I had Never Any Story, which is pretty much good except for a couple scenes like the one I'm going to share in a minute. And um, I had uh, Meatballs. Oh, my Lord. That was horrible. That was going to send me to hell and I didn't know it. Meatballs 2, the camp movies. But I also had like Ernest Goes to Camp. I didn't know the difference. I was like, hey. Anyway, the never-ending story, there's a scene. Does anybody remember Atreyu? I wanted to be him. The kid had like a stick, and he, he killed a wolf, the nothing, with like a stick in the woods. I mean, the kid could do anything. He was like eight, but he was a warrior. Does anybody remember Atreyu? My kid said, is that a boy or a girl? I said, it's a boy. It's Atreyu. I said, you're so, you're so discriminating. And I, I don't know, I sent them an email or something. So there's a scene where Atreyu is at these two statues. Does anybody remember the statues? We won't talk about how the statues looked, Tricia, because that part wouldn't really fit in church. But, but see, what was more important in the way they looked was what they were going to do if Atreyu didn't get up on his, his feet and run through this gate. See, the statues, they were these two ladies. They're like part human, part animal. I don't know. They were freaky weird and it wasn't Jesus-like at all. And they weren't dressed appropriately. But, but as people won through this gate, they would zap them with their eyes. The lasers would hit them. It's scriptural. And, and there was all these previous people who tried to go through. Nate, have you seen this? Everybody's seen this. It's in the 80s, it's a it's never ending story. The luck dragon. I'm a luck dragon. Come on, people. Anyway, if you didn't make it through fast enough, those lasers would zap you into dust. And so I think it was the little old elf man telling Atreyu, you, you got to go. You got to go now. Because as he was hesitating out of fear, the ladies were doing this. And then their eyes were shut and their eyes started open. 
and the music gets suspenseful. And he's like, oh, oh, my Lord Jesus, he prayed. He should have prayed, but he didn't because he's probably an atheist at that time or he was a pagan. They didn't serve Jesus. But he knew that if he didn't start running, he was toast. He couldn't go backwards. He had to go through and he had to go now. All that to tell you that we all have that moment. And that's what the Israel had in the waters is now when God says, go now. He said, I'm going to glorify. I'm going to be glorified through the enemy. I'm going to be glorified through the situation. What he means is when they look back and remember what God did to the enemy, they will know that God brought them through it. So when you look back on the situation that hurts right now, because I know you're all in some pain in some situations that you have good poker faces right now, but in a couple years, when you look back, you'll see that God was glorified through the situation that now you're living in the place you asked God to take you to. He's going to remind you. He's going to glorify. He's going to be glorified through the process, through Pharaoh, through the Egyptians, The Bible is written for us. It's not for God. He doesn't need his word. He is his word. We need it. It's for us. It's to supply us and work through us. What are we willing to do for God? It's a tough question when the chariots are running at me. Well, remember what God did. He took the cloud and the angel and he put them between, what's that verse? I wrote it down, verse 20. He put the cloud and the angel coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud broke darkness, brought darkness to one side and light to the other side. So neither went near the other all night long. I don't know about you, but that tells me that if God is between it, nothing can hurt you. God is between the problem and the fruition of the joy that's going to come from it through the process. He's in between it. He's the blocker. He's the safety net. He's the canopy over the earth. He's in between. And as long as you know he's in between, you're good. If God is between you and any obstacle you shall face, well, then what? This is nothing but a thing. I don't have to worry about that no more, Nate. Because I already said it is finished and it's good. And God says, if I'm in between, you don't got to worry about what's on the dry land. I said, go. I said, go now. When God says, go, what will you do? What will you do? Will you stay with the Egyptians or will you go to the promised land? He can't protect you if you don't cross the sea. He can't protect you if you don't cross the sea. He never stops using us to manifest his miracles. He he opened up, he provided. He's the provision of the Israelites by parting the sea. But they have a free will to choose. Do I want to cross it? Do I want to really get out of this? God will not pull your strings. You are not a puppet. That's other, that's, that's not gospel. That's what's so powerful about this gospel is that no matter what you've done or what you've held yourself back with because of your past, God says, I'm not going to pull your strings, but I will part the waters. If you are willing to go through them, I will do it. I'll bring you the greatest blessing in the, in the, in the, in the most, in the most driest season that people think I'm not working. That's when I'll do it. But you got to go. You got to go. If y'all could stand this morning, remember what's in between. Remember what's in between. When God says go, and everybody left the church. No, no, no. No, when God says go spiritually, people. Oh, it's the worship team. Thank you, Lord. (laughs) I thought everybody was just going, like going to McDonald's or something. What did Nate say? Everybody's thinking about lunch. Everybody just going to Burger King. No. God is calling you to make a decision to go through the pain, 
the pressure, the problem, to be free of the pain, the problem, the pressure. Jesus went to the cross. He didn't sidestep the cross. He had to go on the cross to get to the tomb for resurrection. There was no avoiding the cross, the pain, the torture, the suffering in order to be free at last and conquer sin through the resurrection. Remember this morning what's in between. Remember that God has placed his angels, his loving arms around you and the barrier. Darkness can't touch it. It can't touch it because it can't see what God is doing. We used to hear in church all the time, don't speak it out loud because then the devil knows. I don't really know. I just cast out fear with faith. I just speak good no matter what. Speak life to it. Claim it. Be bold with your faith. Claim it. This is not a maybe. If God does this, God's doing it and we'll do it. And if I got to wait till the ends of the earth of time, God will do it because when he finally says, okay, it's, it's sprouted out the ground, it's time to go. When God says go. When I try to stop them with the megaphone, those Easter egg people, crazy people, they said, no, we're going anyway. There's no stopping us, pastor, with your megaphone because God said go. So you're going to see that. You're going to see that in this church. You're going to see that in your walk with God. If you trust God on that, you're going to see something happen that is bigger than what you physically see here. It's going to be bigger. It's going to be life changing. It's going to be leaving some people outside looking in going, we don't have a, we don't know what to say to that because statistically it's just not possible. But with God, all things are possible and we break the barrier of the word to the world telling us we can't do it. God says it's time to go. Quote me on that. Great is your faithfulness. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Let's remember that God will deliver in the least of seasons of what we expect. He will deliver when we least expect because great is your faithfulness. Great is your perfection, God, that you are to flow through us perfectly and we are gonna keep pushing and plowing and breaking the doubt of the enemy because we know you are perfect in all of your ways. And great is your name, God. Lord, we thank you now for what you've done, what you did, and what you're doing, and what's going to come that is so much bigger than this sea we're crossing. We don't even know what the promised land looks like, but we know it's good because you are good, God, and we give praise for that. We know you're in between us and the doubt of the enemy, and we're no longer worried about it because we're just going to move when you say move, God. Let us take this into our week. Let us have a generous heart for the gospel and show people people that were the real deal. We are one seat church for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are the real deal. We are authentically penetrating hearts with the message of truth that shall never pass away and that we shall be glorified, good and faithful servant on the day of judgment. And if the house of God could say in Jesus name, amen.